All right, welcome everybody. Uh, I think this is the last seminar of the semester, I think. Uh, so this, no? There's one more. Okay, so I have a good start today. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> Always optimizing. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to uh, welcome Professor Deva Romanon here. Uh, Deva has uh, got his PhD from uh, Berkeley uh, with David Forsyth. Uh, he's now a professor at uh, uh, Irvine, University of California at Irvine. In between, he was at uh, TTI Chicago, and interestingly, he was at CMU also. Mm -hmm. What, 2005, you said, right? Yes. For, for summer 2005. So given his great achievements since then, we can shamelessly count him as a CMU person. <laughs> <laughs> I think, right? Sure. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, the great achievement, of course, anybody who is in computer vision uh, knows of his work. Anybody who has done some uh, person detection and uh, tracking and uh, uh, deformable models and uh, uh, object recognition and so forth uh, know, about his, uh, know about his work. Through. Uh, it has been recognized by thousands of citations through his papers and uh, many, many awards, which I'm not going to list now. You can uh, read it online. Uh, instead, I let uh, Deva uh, present his work. Okay, thank you for the, uh, the, the gracious introduction and the invitation to come out and speak. So uh, the title of my talk is Recognizing Objects Using Model-Based Statistics. Um, oh, and I should mention, please interrupt me with any questions, comments during the talk. Uh, so what, I'll, uh, what I will talk about involves a host of collaborators, uh, many of them uh, including former collaborators from my time at TTI Chicago and also students and colleagues at Irvine. Um, all right, so the way I wanted to sort of cast this talk or, or, or uh, uh, actually cast the discussion was um, a distinguishing, distinguishing between two tasks, pattern classification versus visual understanding. So there's a lot of techniques out there now for sort of answering a yes no question of let's look at a crop window and, and ask the question does this contain a person or not. Um, but the kinds of things that at least I, I've been personally interested in for a long time is, is sort of revolves around more detailed reports of what you could say from an image. Uh, and I just feel like because so many images contain people and people do interesting things, we want to really estimate body, arti body articulation, 3D, uh, facial pose, and sort of spatial interaction. So what's happening here is very much defined by what these two people are, are, are doing near each other, the fact that this person is on a bicycle, et cetera. Um, so why would we want to uh, focus on, on these more interesting uh, uh, detailed spatial reports? Uh, so I'm going to sort of ignore the, the next couple of slides because I assume at CMU we don't have to justify why we're interested in this problem. So you guys know about image search, uh, let's say quality of life issues uh, that could possibly be addressed by using cameras, um, wearable cameras, there's also lots of, lots of great work doing, uh, going on here. Uh, and also this, this particular application is motivated a lot by the, the upcoming, uh, I guess, debut of Google Glass. Um, but instead, let's just sort of dig in straight to the, the, the approach. Um, so what I was going to do is first talk about methods for pattern classification. And even though that's a, it seems like a simpler problem, there's still a lot of uh, issues to be addressed there. Um, and then sort of use the, the, the observations from there to, to, to answer, let's say, these more detailed questions. Um, okay, so let's say we want to build a system that can, that can detect people, that can answer the yes, no question, is this a person or not? Um, the reason why this is hard is because people vary in appearance due to illumination, shapes and body sizes, clothing, pose, uh, and occlusion and clutter. So these are classic nuisance factors for, for general object recognition. Um, and so these are the reasons why it's not just hard to find people, but also to find cars and other objects. Um, and so if I were to give like a gross generalization of, of, uh, of, of, of computer vision as a field, I would argue that in its, uh, in its heyday, particularly when we focus on recognition problems, the approaches really were based on geometric models, um, so generalized cylinders um, and geons. And I think that the reason why this seems natural is because if you, it's almost a, an analysis by synthesis approach. So if you're going to synthesize virtual images, well, it makes sense to use geometric primitives like cylinders and spheres and place them in some scene and render them. So if you're going to analyze real images, why not use those same geometric primitives? Uh, but it seems like it's, it's uh, evidently, it, it, it seems to be hard to try to pull these primitives out directly from, from images. And instead, the past decade has become very statistical, where we, instead of building these, these kind of hand-tuned geometric models, we just collect lots of data positive and negative examples, 
feed it to a classifier, um, and then um, spit out something that could tell the difference between, let's say, this positive set of people and this negative set of non-people. Um, and so what, what I think is sort of a rich place to operate is at the intersection of these two, where you still have data-driven models, but they're very geometric in nature. And I'll sort of try to describe these um, in the rest of the talk. Sort of the overall theme uh, in some sense. OK, and so um, maybe I'm sort of preaching to the, the choir here, but the, the Pascal object challenge is sort of the, 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 the de facto place that we look to sort of evaluate uh, object recognition or object detection approaches using these, let's say, 20 set of everyday object categories on, on real images um, from Flickr. Um, and just to sort of take a synopsis of, of where things are, uh, the first year that this was run, performance of, let's say, the, 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 the best performing algorithm got around 1%. Uh, and then, and let's say, in the, in the, in the past six years, we've, we've raised this to, uh, to, to 45%. And so um, I really like this, this graph and this plot just because it sort of shows the, 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 the difficulty of the data set. And so maybe, um, maybe for sort of contemporary vision researchers, it's, it seems obvious that vision is hard. But I always got the sense that but before 2005, it somehow wasn't okay to admit that fact. That we always had to publish papers that had 80 or 90 percent performance, and this made it okay to kind of just be be brutally honest. And so I sort of appreciated this data set for no other reason than that. Um, and I'll I'll talk a little bit about the uh, the the system that we developed with with collaborators, um, and and what I think is is let's say the the, the magic sauce that really makes it work. Um, another common comment I get when I show this graph is that, okay, yes, there's lots of improvement from 2005 to, uh, let's say, the past few years, but it also looks like there's a plateau. Um, and I'll try to give you an argument as to uh, why I think things have plateaued and how we can perhaps move beyond that. Okay, and it's, it's, it's done well. Uh, the system that we developed, the code is in use, and it seems to be sort of the standard in the, in the field now, where if you're going to have some detection method, uh, reviewers are going to complain if you don't compare against this. So, uh, and it is uh, sort of a difficult thing to compare against, even for our own work that we're trying to build off of. Um, and, uh, okay, so a quick five minutes into the model. Uh, folks probably have seen this before. If you take an image, rather than building a model that directly processes pixel values, let's, let's work with in, invariant uh, edge-based or gradient features. And so we'll work with hog. I assume everyone in this room knows what hog is. OK. <laughs> and then we just build our simple classifier. We assemble positive examples, negative examples, feed it to a linear classifier, and then um, one nice thing about a linear classifier, it has the same dimensionality as the feature we use. So whatever visualization we use for the feature, we can use for the classifier itself. This is sort of commonplace now. But now we take this, this, uh, this, this template, we sweep it over the image. And wherever the dot product is high with the image features, you get a high score. So just think about this like a match filter. OK. okay. Um, and one thing that's interesting is that uh, if you think about what this model is doing, uh, the features x are always positive because there's their histogram counts. They're, it's the histogram of gradient feature. Um, but the, the template that you learn when you give this to any linear classifier has both positive and negative values. So um, an easy way to sort of decompose that is you can take any vector that has positive and negative values and write this as the difference of two positive vectors. Um, and then if you just move all the, 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 the second set of positives, which are really the negative values, onto the other side, you can see that decision boundary that you finally encode, you can consider as a, as a competition between two template scores, the positive template and the negative template. So, so I think about this as this is something that's designed to find people. And it's something that's designed to find things that people get confused with. So in sort of in the ideal sense, if we had a really rich generative model of the world, we could compete our pedestrian model with other things that it gets confused with, like let's say other image regions that have vertical edge structure, like doorways or pillars. Um, but that's kind of hard to do, because you need to build a model for everything else in the world. It could be confused with a pedestrian. It's much easier just to penalize vertical edges in certain places. And so that's what you learn when you train this discriminatively. 
So, so in some sense, this is just an argument, the, basically the classic argument for discriminative models. That you don't actually model the positive and negative set. You just model the boundary that separates the two. So, so in my opinion, I think this is what was sort of, in some sense, missing from these, these geometric approaches. Where we put a lot of effort into designing what do we expect to see when the object is there, but we kind of ignore the question of, well, what should we see when the object is not there, that, that negative set. Uh, and then just by training things discriminatively with a classifier, you kind of get that, that, that negative model for free. Right. Okay. Um, and another uh, kind of a crucial aspect about this sort of classification problem is that when you assemble your set of positives, it's important to have a huge set of negatives that you fight against. Um, and the reason why is that at test time, if you go implement this in a scanning window, uh, most of the windows you look at don't contain a person. And so you have to fight against this huge imbalanced test set. And you kind of want your training set, ideally, to reflect the, the same distribution you'll see at test time. So you should fight against a huge imbalanced test set, a uh, training set as well. Um, and although we could use, I, personally, I think you know, the fact that we use one learning algorithm over, over another, lo logistic regression versus SVMs versus boosting, I think, in my own view, I think of all those as probably performing pretty similarly. But SVMs are nice because they generate sparse computational problems in that at the end of the day, you don't really need all, this negative, all these negatives. You just need the few examples that are the, the troublemakers. And these are the support vectors. Um, and so, so I think that you know, in, in this era of, of, of big data, you know, when we have training sets that are too large to fit in memory, I think SVMs are really nice because you can still optimally solve those problems as long as, at the very least, you can hold the support vectors in memory. OK. And so you, you, you apply the previous approach, and you can build a model that looks like it's tuned for really upright pedestrians. But how do we model these, these variations in appearance? And uh, a nice bit of work that, 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 that came out of uh, 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 Santosh, a student here, was a notion of, of subcategories, where you take your set of positives of a particular class and subdivide it. And so now you train models for. Uh, for images of people in this pose, and hopefully you see something like this, and likewise for other poses. And so we could ask, well, why doesn't this actually address these, this variation question that I, that, I, that I initially showed? I said, the real reason why it's hard to find people is because they vary in appearance. But now we sort of have a tool for dealing with variation in appearance, which is just split up your set of images into different types of appearances and train a model for each. Um, and the reason why at least I think this, is, uh, this, this doesn't end up solving the problem in practice, is because um, although you can kind of do that and model the dominant appearances that you tend to see, uh, there's a lot of rare appearances that each one by itself, you don't look around and see too many people in this strange pose. But if you collectively take the set of strange things you could see, it actually forms a long tail. And so what, what, what I believe is this is the reason why we're still uh, missing, um, uh, 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 let's say, 30 or 40 percent of, of performance is because what I think the systems we have now are good at are, are the dominant appearances, but not the rare ones. Right. Okay, and so one way to handle the rare appearances is this sort of representation called the deformable part model, where you break up a template into little parts. And now, by letting these little parts move around, you can, you can model these rare poses. Uh, and these really have a, have a, have a, have a rich, uh, rich classic history and vision. Um, and so what I thought I'd do is just do a, a, a quick run through of, 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 of how these, these things kind of mathematically work. So if you give me an image x, um, let's say you also tell me uh, a hypothetical location of parts. Um, and so each part is parameterized by its pixel location. Um, and given this location of parts, an image where I place the head here and the elbow here, I want to generate a score for how well um, this set of part, uh, how well this placement of parts matches the image. And the score is going to have two terms. First, I'm going to go through and from the image at that pixel location, I'll grab the image descriptor, the, the hog feature, and I'll just take a dot product with a template tuned for that, uh, that part i. 
and I'll sum these scores over all parts. Okay. All right. Someone should ask a question if it's not making sense, but I think everyone's on board here. All right, then we'll have a pairwise term, which is uh, for each pair of parts, um, let's say connected uh, with some constraint, I'm going to look at the relative location of the x and y locations, of the x and y positions of those parts, and then take a dot product with four parameters. Um, and because I'm looking at the relative location, the relative location squared, I can interpret this dot product is a quadratic function that has a sweet spot, that has a minimum, which is where I want these two parts to be. And I can pull those two parts away from that minimum with some quadratic cost. And because it's quadratic, you can think about this like a, uh, uh, like a spring term. Right? So that's why we sort of, I, I like visualizing these things with little red springs between pairs of parts. Now, um, another way to think about this is once someone has, a, another way to think about these spring models is that um, if someone uh, has given you a, a set of uh, these four numbers for every pair of parts connected by a spring, you can now think about this as a spring mass system and shake it and see how it moves. And so this is what those, those springs sort of encode. So these are, these are deformation modes of a particular set of springs that you would learn from a, a data set for faces. Um, so you can see now, this is, so I claim this is what a, what a part model gives you. It gives you a way to encode a near continuous family of, of, of global templates um, in an efficient way where you get to reuse local patches. Okay. All right. And now we notice that um, this score uh, is linear in the, the template appearances, W, and the spring parameters, Wij. So I can concatenate all the image features and the pick, um, part location offsets into one big vector and just take a dot product with all the local templates and the, the spring parameters and get my score out. And so this really gives the hint as to why uh, this thing can be trained um, discriminatively because now it's just a linear score and we have Lots and lots of tools for, for tuning linear parameters. Okay. And the way I think about this is in the supervised case, imagine someone gives you positive examples where they tell you where the part locations are. Now, for each image where I know the part locations in blue, I can extract this big feature of five, which again is just a vector of the local hog descriptors plus the, the offsets between pairs of parts. And now someone gives me a set, uh, a negative image, and now it is not, it's not very clear what the right part location is in the negative image. But what instead what we can say is for any placement of parts, I want to make sure the model scores this uh, very, very poorly, less than minus one. So what we can do now is for each negative image, you can enumerate all possible placements of parts and say each of those is a negative constraint. I want to make sure that score is less than minus one. And of course, the, the reason why th this looks a bit hopeless because there's a huge number of placements of, of ways to place, uh, place the parts. But we get to exploit the exact same sparsity of, of this, the, the magicness of an SVM where only a few of these things actually matter. And so that's why you can actually train this. You can fit these things in memory even though you can't fit all the other stuff in memory. So you're going to use the parts in a supervised manner? Yeah, so, uh, so first I'm, I'm just, I guess I'm just describing this in the supervised way because I think it's easier to think about the whole learning algorithm in this way. So when it's, when it's supervised, this, the, in the way I described it, and in fact the way we implemented it, is really no different than a, than a binary SVM problem. We have positive features and negative features. Um, so even in the case of supervised, you cannot train them independently, all these parts? Because right now this is not independent at all. Yeah, not at all. So, so I actually think this is one reason why, it, it, especially when you have small parts, I think it's very important, uh, very useful to, to train them contextually and not independently. So normally if I was training a, a, a template for, let's say, my, my wrist, then you, you might think that the, there's a lot of things in the world that locally look like pieces of wrist. And so I have a huge set of hard negatives. But now I will only see hard negatives for entire configurations that score high. Um, so for example, imagine that it's always, it might be hard to build a good wrist, wrist template, but it's always easy to get, build a good face template. So I only have to fight against wrists that score near some 
a region that looks like a face. Yeah. 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 Because I mean, what you can do is you can train them independently, then try to combine using all those functions. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what I'm arguing is that it, it, it's almost this notion of when you train them contextually, you get the benefit of contextual reasoning that. This, he doesn't have to fight against all risk-like regions. He only has to fight against risk-like regions that occur near face-like regions. And that's a much, much smaller set because we can actually build good face detectors. Does that make sense? It still should cover the entire whole space. It's still huge. Uh, it's still huge, but if you, if you can actually look at the, the support set, so the things that actually matter, um, I would claim is going to be smaller when you have these. There's th no yoga for the negative side. The, the long tail that we're talking about is that one going to be in the negative side? Yeah, it should be. So one of these things down here for every negative image, I'm enumerating all possible poses. One of them will be the yoga pose. And it's going to be, it, it's going to be a constraint that the model wants to make sure that yoga pose on this negative image scores less than minus one. But what I claim is, is that just due to the sparseness of the problem, uh, perhaps a better way of saying it is that that will only become a hard pose, uh, a support vector, when there's some image evidence that, that makes that score above minus one. It has to score above uh, the sort of margin constraint. What I'm trying to understand is uh, if I just drop a bunch of bars on any arbitrary image, mm -hmm. that's an exponential number of images, right, or configurations. OK. If I take you know, 10 bars, any location in the image, right? That would be. Yeah, so, 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 so we don't want that. So, so right. well, so, so this rep. Go ahead, sorry. The subset of that is the human pose configuration, uh -huh. which is still pretty large. And so then all the negative examples should have all the human poses, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Is that true? That's true. And you're right. So, what I'm claiming is that all these things. Um, some of these, for every negative image, I'm going to place. I'm going to look at all possible placements of parts on that negative image, and say that I want to make sure that score is below minus one. So some of these placement of parts will look human-like. Some of them will look like rare human poses, like the yoga pose, and some of them won't even look like a human. Um, and so you could argue, well, maybe we shouldn't fight against them. Uh, but the way the optimization is formulated, we do fight against them. But it turns out those will be easy to fight against, because just even with the spring deformation cost will pay such a huge penalty that they won't score above minus one. All right, so it's not like a, a, a crisp delineation, but it's sort of the, the spatial model in the springs is sort of carving up the space into stuff that we need to really care about versus. Although training this way, context dependent, is dangerous if you are also looking for occluded humans and everything and so on. So suppose I'm looking for human which 90% is occluded, 10% is what I, I can see. In that mm -hmm. case, you won't be tra training parts uh, independently would be much, much better because in that case you don't have this context to help you out in the test set, set as well. Yeah, except that you, um, what I claim is, is that you can still train it if the training data has lots of occluded instances and um, if there's no regularity to those occluded instances. So, so then it's a circular argument because you said that you don't have, going to, uh, you're not going to have training argument, training data for the occluded or these weird poses. That's what we begin. We, ah. That's how we went into the parts that we said, okay, we are never going to have all possible data for everything. So let's. So we want something generic. And now you are saying that if we have training data, we can have. Okay. So that's that's a fair point, and I'll get into that in just a second. Okay. So so what we're going to hope is that the occlusions can factor in the same way these these appearances can factor. So I can't model all the appearances of poses, but I can model local heads and. And, and elbows, and by moving those around, I can create a whole bunch of different appearances of people in different poses. I mean, this is a very different notion of part if you're training it in a contextual dependent manner. Because I think when we you talk about these geometric things, I mean, we thought that I mean that these parts can be detected independently. Yeah. They might be just very bad in detections. Yeah. But when you combine them together, they will just work great. Yeah. I mean, that was a story which we had initially. We as in as a community. As a community. Yeah. I mean, I did that. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so I completely agree. So from this perspective, you can think of parts as just an indexing trick. What's really important, and this is the way I think about it, when I explain part models to my students now, I, I think the actual equations kind of hide the, the simplicity of what's happening. 
So every part model can be written as just a set of global templates. And I'm showing, I'm showing you those global templates now. So I think it's just an efficient way to index into this huge set and then also to share parameters amongst this huge set. Um, but it's almost like a, a computational trick. Uh, but this is really the model. Okay, in an inference, everyone knows this, so I place parts down at a particular location. I compute the score, which is based upon how well each of these templates matches the image evidence and how much I pay for this spring deformation cost. And I try out all exponential part placement of parts for the highest scoring one or for ones that score above some threshold, and I call those detections. Um, and as to why you can do the search efficiently, well, it's because there's independence assumptions. Uh, so if you assume it's something like a temporal Markov model where you, you kind of assume that given the present state, future predictions are independent of the past, you can make a, a spatial Markov model assumption that given the torso, the left arm is independent of the right arm. And what that means is when you search over all possible combinations of arms, legs, and torsos, for every torso that you search over, you imagine you have sort of a cascade of four loops, you know, for every head location, for every torso location, for every arm location. What you can do is for every torso location, you can independently find the best left arm and right arm. And so that, that gives you this, this, this magical savings where it ends up being not exponential the number of parts, but linear. So this is just dynamic programming. And in fact, that there's, uh, through additional speed ups from, uh, from, from, from uh, Pedro Felsenschwab and Dan Huttenlocker, you can even make this faster, where it's no more expensive than just running a, a taking your local parts and scoring them at every image location. Uh, so in some sense, you get this, this extra spatial reasoning for free. Um, OK, uh, I'm not really going to talk about this, but uh, the actual system that, that, that kind of um, uh, is, sort of is, is, is widely used doesn't operate in the supervised regime. It operates in an unsupervised way, where you're just given positive bounding boxes and still a large collection of negatives. And the system latently infers what the right set of parts will be and then tunes those parts. Um, so I won't talk about uh, exactly how this works, but then kind of argue that it's really a form of discriminative clustering. Um, and in my opinion, that there's some things that are still not well understood about how this discriminative clustering works. Since you're not going to talk Yes. Uh, uh, so what do you think, I mean, from your experience? Should we go supervised with parts or should we go unsupervised with parts? Because, I mean, uh, what's going to help you, supervised or unsupervised? Yeah, so, so for like the past few years, we've been getting a lot of mileage, at least in our group, out of, out of trying stuff with supervision. Just because it was easier to optimize, it's convex, sort of weird things don't happen. It's, it's, more, it's a more well-behaved kind of way of pursuing research. <laughs> and so now we're at this regime where I think the interesting question is, is what, what are the right parts? And so it's not really a matter that they're expensive to label. We just don't know what the right things are to label. So, so, I, so now I'm sort of uh, of the belief that the, the latent question is really the important one. Um, but uh, the way that the current optimization solves it, I think, is, is very susceptible to local minima. Uh, so I think there could be other, other, other approaches, including the kinds of techniques you've been working on here. Um, so one thing that, that I'm very curious about is that it could be that the actual um, objective formulation is right. We're just doing a bad job of optimizing it. So maybe what we just need are, are more aggressive search, uh, more CPUs to try different initializations and doing some sort of uh, clustering optimization. Um, Okay, so in terms of latent variable classification, instead of, you know, previously we had some image patch X, we compute a hog feature phi, and we take a dot product with W, and wherever this scored better than zero, we'd say, yes, there's a pedestrian here. Now, um, we, for every image location X, for every possible set of parts Z, we compute a score, which again is just a dot product of a big model parameter with a big feature. And now we search for the high scoring placement of parts. And if that high scoring placement score exceeds zero, then we'll claim that this is a person. So in some sense, I think that this, um, this, this notion of, uh, this is one way to kind of 
factor out nuisance variables at, at test time. So I would call this latent variable classification. But this by itself doesn't necessarily mean that Zs have to be un, uh, latent at, at train time. In fact, I talked about the first training method where you're told where the parts are at train time. Um, OK, and if you wanted to train this, if f was a linear classifier, we just put it in some objective function that says, given a bunch of data, we want to learn a low norm model that on all the positive examples score bigger than one. We want it to score bigger than one. If not, we pay the difference. And all the negative examples, it should score less than one. And if not, we pay the difference. It's just a standard uh, um, SVM. Um, but now we can replace it with this, this beast that, that does a search over latent uh, latent values. And now this thing is almost convex. And the way that we typically optimize this is with, with some sort of coordinate descent. So this was the argument that I just gave to, to Abhinav. Uh, I kind of believe that this could actually be the right thing to optimize. We're just doing a bad job at optimizing it. And so one of the things that, that, that we're pursuing are more aggressive computational strategies of trying to search over this to actually search for the right representation, the right set of parts. Um, All right, so here's the, here's the, so, so it, as I said before, this is sort of, uh, I think, my, my, my favorite scheme of, of visualizing these models now. So rather than showing you the parts, I just want to give you a sense of the, of the, the global templates that are generated by this model. Uh, so hopefully you can, you can tell what, what object category this is. What was that? It's a car. It's a car. Um, so as, as sometimes parts of the, the object deform, uh, parts of the model move around to better align with the image data. Um, so this is the second entry into the game. What object is this? Bicycle. Bicycle. Um, again, here you can kind of see the parts are moving to model affine deformations of this bicycle. Um, Some of the deformations would be a Especially when it starts to move up here. Yeah, yeah. So I think this is, the, this is a limitation of the model still. Um, but nevertheless, this is the set of templates that it tends to generate. Um, and so parts themselves are just a tool to help organize this set. But this is really what the model is doing. Yes, go for it. Any reason why the center of the star model is not actually at the center of the object? Um, oh, so this is a visualization issue. Um, there's a root coordinate, or there's a sort of a coordinate frame that we have to uh, zero things out at. And so for whatever reason, I think maybe this is just sort of fitting a tight bounding box, and it's aligning to that tight bounding box. OK, but I'm talking about on the right, how the, everything seems to be connected to that one node that is. Oh, oh, this is, this is for, for visualization purposes. You could imagine that it's um, the way that it's kind of implemented in the code is that every, all positions are recorded with respect to the top left corner. Um, but in reality, you could kind of shift it to the center point if you'd like. It, it, it won't change the behavior of the model. OK. How about the number of parts? Ah, that's fixed, just magically. <laughs> uh, but that's another place where I think that, that the, the representation choice has been hard coded. And I feel like if we just searched over that, we could, we could perhaps do a fair bit better than, than what we're seeing now. Um, this object? Yes, it's a cat. Um, so it turns out to end, the model ends up looking for essentially a cat face detector. And so this also reveals some of the issues with, with scoring. So these are counted as, as, as incorrect cat detections because it doesn't cover the entire uh, cat body. So uh, what this also suggests is that we're probably doing a bit better than the numbers indicate uh, because we're, we're, we're running into situations like this. Right? And then qualitatively, it, it, it seems like we are doing a bit better than the numbers would indicate. Uh, and so just to sort of prove that this stuff Oh, oh, so it actually turns out that there's, if, if someone never, if no one ever told you, there's lots of cats on the internet. Um, and so Google actually implemented this as a, 
as a as as, as April's fool as an April Fool's joke for this year, they 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 made a, a pet emoticon detector. So if you had images it in Google Picasa, it would automatically be labeled with little emoticons next to all the dogs and, and cats. And they actually used this system to build a dog and cat detector. So it's funny because people actually thought that this April Fool's joke was done by someone sitting there and labeling, <laughs> finding all the cats and dogs. So, so we, I, I would consider that a success. So it, it was an automatic algorithm that, that, that the general public thought was, was manually done. Uh, Okay, so now in some sense, uh, all that stuff was, was kind of review, and let's, let's now dig into how do we use the machinery we've we developed there for more, more intricate um, kind of shape-driven analysis. All right. Okay, so if, if I were to kind of lay out the, the way that, 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 at least from my perspective, I think shape is modeled in, in vision, is that we sort of have two extremes. We can start with a very simple rigid model, which is a rigid template, there's almost no real shape, and go all the way to almost like a computer graphics mesh-based elastic model. And the kinds of models that I showed uh, in the first half of the talk, I would argue are, what they really capture are sort of affine deformations of a template. So you saw that the parts wiggled, but never too far away from their rest location. And what that allowed you to do is model, let's say, shifted, uh, slightly rotated, slightly scaled, um, uh, slightly transformed uh, templates. Now, uh, what I claim is though, is that you can actually use this same kind of part framework to um, explore a space in between these two things where it tries to be more flexible, um, but it's not quite as, as, as restricted as, a, as let's say a star model where each part is placed independently given some roots. Um, and this really begs the question, right, what is the right structure? How do you pick the right parts? What is the right connectivity? And, and an interesting place to, to look at these issues um, where they have been looked at is, uh, is, is human pose estimation. So this is kind of interesting because I think for probably 30 years, if someone asked the question, well, what are the right parts to use for, for human pose estimation? The answer would be, well, it's obvious. You should use articulated limbs. Um, and then what's been kind of neat is that in recent years, people have questioned this. Uh, and so there's a large body of work that, that really came out of, originated at Berkeley, uh, where they advocated this notion of, of, of things that are bigger than limbs, sort of regions that include parts of the body and, uh, and other parts of the, let's say, limbs. Um, while we, on, on the other hand, have been exploring models that have even smaller parts. Um, and so the intuition I would have is that by having smaller parts, you can model more deformations. If you look at these images of these, these eigenvectors, you'll have richer, richer shapes that you can model when you have small things moving around. But what's surprising, or uh, sort of a point of fact, is that it seems like there's been a lot of recent work that actually pushes in this, this other direction of building larger parts, where instead of reasoning about big chunks of the, of the object, you even reason about the entire object at once, or even reason about multiple objects at once. Um, so, so there's this natural question to ask, what, what are we not getting? And wh wh why this, this kind of approach where we look at bigger and bigger things, when it seems like looking at smaller and smaller things allows you to, to do better at understanding shape? Right? And what I claim is, is that these things actually uh, have, have this great insight in that they address uh, a limitation of part models that I'll, I'll try to uh, uh, kind of go over here. And, and the limitation is sort of based on this idea of part models as classically defined seem to have uh, an implicit factorization of local appearance and global geometry. So what it means is, is that if I take my head template and put it somewhere in the image, as I move that template around, I want to use the same appearance. And even as I move my other parts around, I want to use that same head template. In some sense, that's what it means to almost be a part. I get to reuse the same local appearance. Um, but in reality, this independence assumption breaks down um, when you have occlusions, when you have 3D viewpoint changes, and when you have articulation. So a simple example of this is if I now deform other parts of my body, such that my hand is in front of my face, now my, my, my head looks very different. The, the gradient patterns you see are, are very, very different. So what that suggests is that the geometry of other things 
can affect profoundly the way that I look locally. Uh, and so I think that this is something that uh, classic parts don't, don't model well. And one way to address this change is to use bigger and bigger templates. So I think this is really the insight of, of, of this body of work, where if you're going to try to model a person, let's say, interacting with an object, um, so a person riding a, a horse, you don't see the, the rear leg because it's completely occluded by the horse body. But what's nice, though, is that if you train a global template with images of people in this similar pose and interaction, you just don't see an edge corresponding to that occluded leg. So when you learn this appearance, you correctly score the occlusion. Um, but the problem with, with this approach is that you might need lots of global templates to model all the types of interactions you could have. Um, but then what we can do is we could apply the same sort of, of kind of argument or insight from the uh, sort of part models where what we want to do is we want to create small patches that allow us to index into this set of visual phrase templates. And one way of doing that is we just cut this up into little squares and we allow these to deform around and mix and match. Right? So this was sort of the, the, the argument of, of, you're right, we're still trying to look at, we hope that the training data spans occlusions that we care about, but we still get to sort of reconstruct occlusions by having little patches and moving them around. So one way to think about it is, um, let's assume that, uh, what's a good way of saying this? Let's assume that um, um, I'm sitting and there's a table in front of me. So there's an occluding edge that you see that the table's there. And so what you could do is rather than requiring um, in the training data to see all possible levels of height of this table occlusion, you can put little parts that actually measure the, encode the occluding boundary. And now by letting those parts deform and move, you can actually model different types of occlusions. So it's still trying to apply some sort of factorized approach to capturing the space of, of visual appearances you see during occlusions. Um, OK, so the, the, the way we're going to operationalize that is with local mixtures. Although if you can, if Go you for can it. see all the occlusions, then why not just model this thing? Sure. So then, but, but then I argue that there should still be a long tail. So that's what is not clear. If you're learning this, all these parts together in context, how does long tail? I mean, what I believe is to handle long tail, you need to do parts in, independent of each other so that they can be detected even if the same context is not occurring. Um, so the way I would answer that is uh, when I show you these, these movies of, of, let me just skip forward here. So right now, I'm showing you deformation modes of, uh, of an articulated model. And this model was learned with 100 images. So what that means is there was actually 100 unique global templates that were ever seen during training. Yet this thing, what I'm showing you now, are much more than 100. And the reason why you can kind of see new things is that because we've, we've introduced some independence assumptions about how things can move, and we have low dimensional parametric models on how we define the spatial, uh, spatial interactions, I'm showing you new configurations, new arrangements of things that we never saw during training. And that's where this generalization comes from. Okay. In fact, the vast majority of what you see at test time are things, are spatial arrangements that you did not see at train time. So I, I think that's where the, uh, the generalization comes from. So the, the last little sort of implementation trick is now instead of, if, I, if you give me a whole bunch of hands, let's say, of people riding bicycles, rather than training sort of one hand template for all these hands, I'll split up this set of bicycle images into those based on uh, different viewpoints of frontal hands or side hands, or hands on handlebars, or even hands um, occluded by the body. And I will just learn a separate hand template for each of those four cases. You lose the uh, um, So you can do it in sort of either way, where someone tells you the mixture label, they tell you if it's, if it's occluded or not, or you try to do this in a latent reassignment way. So what we do is we actually first do some sort of clustering to figure out what the mixture assignment should be. Uh, and the clustering is based on uh, sort of key point positions. It's like poselet clustering, if you think about it. 
So now we just modify the scoring function where now the scoring function depends not just on the location of the parts but on the mixture ID of the parts. We'll call that T. And given I use a mixture, a particular mixture for a head, I just want to make sure I use that mixture when I score the appearance. And then the other perhaps more interesting bit is when I compute the, 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 the spring penalty between two part locations, I have a pair of spring, I have a spring defined for each particular pair of parts. So I have, if I have elbow number three and I have hand two, I have a particular spring that tells me what I expect the, the, the rest location of elbow three and hand two to be and how much I, I, I penalize deviations from that rest location. So if I have four possible elbows, four possible hands, I have 16 springs. Right? And so what's crucial is that these springs depend on the mixtures. And so this allows us to have geometry affect appearance and alternatively have appearance affect geometry. So this is, this is what I claim is, is what breaks this independence assumption. Um, and that you can kind of visually see here. So what I'm showing is another eigenvector of uh, sort of a common deformation mode. But uh, I'm denoting a color here as a single mixture. Whenever the, the color changes, uh, that means a different, a different template is being swapped out locally. And so what you see is when things, let's say, tend to occlude each other, a color will change because because now we have springs that depend upon the position of things, uh, when I move things to a different location, uh, the spring kind of switches and triggers a different local mixture. So this, this allows us to at least try to reason about local changes in appearance that are induced by global geometry. Okay. Um, and you can use these kinds of models for uh, trying to understanding uh, interactions of people with objects. And like I mentioned before, uh, let me just skip this. You can also do this for, um, you can also apply this for even uh, images of people without objects. So just standard <laughs> human body pose. These are the different local mixtures that fire as someone moves their arm and legs about. And so what you'll oftentimes see is that you can also use this as a trick to not just model occlusions, but different articulations. You'll see the pattern of edges change depending upon, let's say, the orientation of the leg. Okay, and so this, this ends up working reasonably well and reasonably fast, at least faster than previous approaches to, to pose estimation. And one reason why is that sort of a classic approach to estimating pose, I think prior to this, was to use a family of warped templates. We actually took a, a, a leg template and you tried stretching it and foreshortening it and then rotating it and you scored each ro rotated and foreshortened version uh, in, in the image. But now by using smaller parts, we're essentially using dynamic programming to share computation amongst this family of warps. Um, let's see if that makes sense. Okay, um, and so here's sort of an extension of um, basically the same approach. Uh, if you build detailed landmark, landmark models of cars, it turns out that you can get uh, enough accuracy to try to estimate um, uh, a 3D shape of a particular uh, car instance. So I think a, an interesting direction to push this is to, um, as these occlusion-aware mixtures do a better job of understanding self-occlusion, it almost feels like this thing could be a 3D-ish a, a, a model. But, but clearly there, there's still sort of some, some strange planar effects happening here that we're, we're trying to figure out. Uh-huh. So when you're modeling something, when you're modeling the 3D shape of something, uh, and you have these self occlusions, the model stops being a tree. That is, you have to start putting in some kind of relational edge between objects that uh, parts that end up to each other. Mm -hmm. So, but you kind of handle this with the uh, mixture trick. So, do mm -hmm. you think there's an advantage to trying to model full thing over the? Yeah, so, so I think that's a, an interesting research direction of, it seems like one story that's, that seems to emerge is that in terms of spatial constraints, sparse connectivity kind of works okay. Like a star model actually can get you pretty far. Uh, and now if you have these more kind of discrete occlusion events, it's not clear if that sparse connectivity is, will, will, is, is going to go far enough. Um, one trick you can do though is that with local mixtures, you can still, um, you can capture global constraints. So imagine one, one kind, of, kind of dumb brute force way to deal with that 
is you just enumerate all possible views of an object, or let's say quantize into every one degree, and you have 360 mixtures. In each one of those, you encode what is the, the occlusion mixtures that you see, what are the local mixtures you see. And you can enforce that as a global constraint. Um, so in some sense, by uh, even in this tree world, by adding extra uh, mixture variables, you can kind of quantize your way out of the, the deficiency of the tree. Um, but I still don't know sort of if, if that will work in the long run or not. Um, make sense? Okay. okay. Um, and so something that, that I think is, is, is interesting too is that if you can, uh, in some sense, sort of looking for reasons for why we want to do detailed spatial reports of, of let's say, object landmarks. And I think one interesting one is that so far, um, um, it seems like in terms of object detection, we're, we've become very focused on bounding box prediction. But in reality, uh, what's, what's crucial from, let's say, uh, a more functional perspective is we want to know how do we interact with an object. So we can imagine that there's very particular landmarks that tell us where we can sit, where we can rest our hands, or where we can rest our backs. Um, and you can now try to sort of evaluate how well can these deformable models do at predicting these functional landmarks. Um, so I think this is just a, uh, an interesting uh, perspective on, on what should a, an object, de object de sy detection system report. Um, uh, uh, temporal models, let's skip that. And instead, let's say for the last 10 minutes, let's sort of dig it into one more example of this thing uh, in recognition. And this is probably the most well-studied recognition problem, which is face detection. So it turns out you can build these models for, for detecting faces. And uh, you can build models tuned for different viewpoints and also different expressions. And this model was actually trained using uh, the CMU MultiPy database. Um, and it works pretty well. Um, and so once again, in addition to giving you a detection plus, let's say, a face pose, you also get uh, landmark locations out. So you can evaluate this as a, as a landmark prediction uh, algorithm. Oh, and so we've sort of seen this already. Uh, these are the, 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 the spring deformation modes you get out when you, when you train one of these models from a collection of images of faces that have been supervised and labeled with landmark positions. Um, the other interesting thing is that you can also see that these models do a decent job of handling uh, uh, 3D shape variation. So it looks like this model is in 3D, but it's, it's just a mixture of 2D, uh, 2D, 2D springs. Um, what, what I am showing here is that I'm training different global mixtures for different viewpoints. So you see that the actual edge pattern changes every now and then. And that's because it's switching from one mixture to another. Within a mixture, we're still capturing some 3D variation, and that's coming from the spring tension, uh, these, these springs that allow you to deform. OK, so now if you evaluate uh, uh, just classic face detection accuracy on, um, on, on some of those images I showed earlier. So we collected some images uh, from Flickr that we thought were hard and challenging. Uh, OpenCV, um, perhaps not surprisingly, uh, at least, well, to me it was somewhat surprising, doesn't do that great. It gets about 40% precision and 70% recall. Uh, we took the same set of images and ran them through Google Picasa and Face.com, which is now um, part of Facebook. And what was uh, surprising to me was this gap in performance, how Picasa and Face.com nearly get sort of perfect performance. Uh, uh, Picasa makes no... Uh, no, no false positive predictions. It has 100% pre precision. Um, and so one argument could be, well, maybe the difference from here to here is we don't quite know exactly what's happening inside these systems. We, we can make guesses. But maybe one interpretation is it's more or less the kinds of architectures that have been developed in, 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 in vision over the, over the past uh, 20 years. But maybe just scale to have much more training data and much more you know, training time. So that's one hypothesis, that this is what, let's say, big data gives you. Um, so if you, if you run our, our system, um, it ends up doing pretty well. Uh, and what, what, what perhaps is, is surprising is that the model we have is trained on hundreds of faces. 
versus there's evidence to suggest that, that these models, these other models, are actually trained with millions or billions of examples. Um, so uh, it, it's kind of interesting to sort of dig into what's actually happening here and, and why do we get away with so little training data. And just before we move on to that, you can also evaluate these models in terms of localization performance of landmark prediction. And it looks like they still do well compared to uh, uh, a bunch of the state of the art that, that we found at that time. Uh, and I still think these are, these are pretty competitive models for landmark, landmark prediction. <clears throat> OK, so if we try to analyze where is this improvement really coming from. Um, so the argument I made before is that every distinct placement of part Z yield a unique global template. So we can think about uh, a, a deformable part model as a way just to index a set of global templates. But if that's the case, we can ask ourselves, when will it do better than a, a collection of global templates? Particularly, imagine you train a set of global templates with lots and lots of training data. Shouldn't that basically behave the same as, as a DPM, which is also something that indexes a large set of, of global templates? So what we do is uh, we compare against um, um, uh, Tomasz's work here from CMU, uh, where we compare against our model against something like a, an exemplar SVM, or rather an exemplar SVM. And if you think about the set of global templates, a new, an exemplar SVM is for every training image, you just train a global template. And so if you have 1,000 training images, you have 1,000 global templates. And now you can compare that against a DPM staying on, trained on the same 1,000 images but now the DPM can index a very large set of global templates. So how does this set of global templates compare to the original set of 1,000? Um, and so what I argue is that there's, there's three differences. One is that the DPM will share parameters across its set of global templates. So the nose that you train gets to be averaged across all noses from your, your training image, from your training images, versus in the exemplar, sort of nearest neighbor case, Every training image, you only get to see that one particular nose, and so you build a template for that. So you might suffer from, from noise issues there. Um, the other thing you get with, with sort of the set of, of global models produced by the DPM is that you will see global templates that weren't part of the original 1,000. So this was the point that I made to you earlier. Uh, and then finally, this, let's say, uh, the last point is sort of a computational one, is that you can think of parts as a way to efficiently search over this huge set. Uh, rather than just enumerating over the, the actual set of 1,000 you've seen. Okay, so now if we ignore this last line, we can try to examine the performance increase of one versus two. <clears throat> and the way that we can do that is we can train a model, which is just a collection of rigid templates, but we force these rigid templates to share the same nose parameters. So now this gets the benefit of one, but we don't do two. We don't synthesize new global templates that weren't seen amongst the original training set. Does that make sense? Okay. So when you tie in one model or multiple models? You meaning local mixtures or global mixtures? Yeah. Uh, so I think in this experiment we do one. So we actually compare that against... A, that is negative to the, if you use one. When there was no, if, you tie, if you're tying parameters from nodes across the data, you should have multiple nodes. Yeah, so what's surprising is that you still do well if you tie all those parameters together. Uh, if you have different ones, you do a little bit better. But w I'll, I'll do an apples to apples comparison. Well, I'll compare our model with a single nose mixture versus this, uh, this mixture of rigid exemplars with a single nose mixture. So you do a normal, let's say, uh, mixture of exempl uh, uh, exemplar SVM model. And this is the performance we get as we increase the number of training data. So in fact, what we tried to do was a little bit better um, uh, what we thought might be better than an exemplar SVM, which is we actually tried clustering the data and we cross-validated over the number of clusters. Um, <clears throat> so we tried to kind of sort of say, given that we have, let's say, a thousand images, what is the best way we can train a global template model or a mixture of global templates? Um, and this is the best that we could do. Now, if you take uh, essentially those sets of, of global templates but now you force sharing between these, these part regions, it performance increases to that, that blue line. Um, and now, if you allow for hallucinated templates that you never saw during training, the performance increases to that red line. So what I claim is that that last bit, the distance from the blue to the red, 
I would call sort of the extrapolation to unseen, uh, unseen global templates. Uh, and so I think about that is, is really part of the, the long tail, where if you're really unlucky, a lot of the long tail you might not even see for any finite training set. So then you really have to do, it seems like it'd be useful to do this kind of extrapolation. You generate a new model for something that, that actually wasn't seen in training. Okay, so I, I think about this as, a, as, a, as an argument against big data. So we, 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 we started this project actually trying to collect more training data and seeing, we, we wanted to sort of you know, drink the big data Kool-Aid, as in we, we wanted to see what it would give us. And, and we struggled with this for a long, long time. Uh, and then what, what this suggests to me is that rather than increasing the data, if we think about better models, we can do much better. We, we sort of get bigger jumps than we could by let's increasing the data another factor of 10. Um. Uh-huh. You have to increase the data effect. I mean, because I see the middle one still rising, whereas the red one is plateauing right now. So, so, so we'll say this, that the middle one by design has to hit the red one with enough training data because yes. that makes sense to you. Yeah, so that's why, I mean, so why, how is it against me? The middle one was designed for big data. Excellent, let's see. The middle one was sub, supposed to be working on one million images. Yeah, so I guess rather than, than, than collect a million images, I would rather just uh, you know, I could jump to that red curve with, with, with 50 training images. You can get performance that seems uh, like it would be very hard to get with actually the original. So I would say the green curve is, is the original, is, is the true sort of nearest neighbor non-parametric model. The blue curve makes use of sharing. <clears throat> and so what it sort of seems is that sharing is important, but the extrapolation is even more important if you think of the reduction in error. Um, so, so, yeah, so, so, so to me what was striking was that with almost 50 or 100 faces, it seems like with smarter representations, you can do better than what you could do with uh, a million examples with sort of a, a, a naive non-parametric representation. Now, this is on faces, and so there's a big caveat yeah. that faces might be weird things, and so that's, that's a fair uh, claim, that's a, fan, that's a fair argument. But for me, at least, this is, this, this is why I think that uh, um, sort of models are, are are just as, if not more, important. Yeah, and so in some sense, that's that's sort of the the, the moral of the story. Where uh, if we think of these these sort of traditional uh, classic approaches that really were very model driven, versus the last ten years where we become very statistical driven. What I think is is really a rich space, is where we think about um, uh, places where we we reason more about uh, sort of classic model issues. So, so there's a sense in the community, and, and we sort of saw this before, that um, you know, recognition has plateaued because we don't see performance really increase. But what I think is exciting is that we have those, those sort of tools now to reason more about these model-based issues like 3D viewpoints, occlusion articulation. So um, I think that's it. Thanks. <laughs>so if you remember the equation that I showed, the WIJs, so what I claim is that WIJ I can encode in a, in a precision matrix that's going to be block sparse. So any, uh, any parts that are connected will have actually a non-zero value. So but the way you actually apply these deformation models, uh, doesn't it kind of lose the, the kind of beautiful structure that you're showing? Because the decision is made you know, part to part to part, right? And so the things that can actually be end up actually representing May not be as, will most likely not be as structured as the, the principal components that you're actually reporting. Okay, so, so here's actually the, a little trick about what I'm showing. There's sort of two ways to interpret it. One is you can look at the, the, the parameters that are learned, the WIJs that are learned, and try to visualize those. Instead, what I'm trying to argue is imagine I don't do any of that. I can just run the detector on some face images. And I can look at what are the, for, associated with every detection, there exists a unique global template that is equivalent to what those parts have scored that detection on. So if you give me a thousand test images, I can give you a thousand templates, which are the global templates. So in some sense, the way to really understand a part model 
is to just look at those 1,000 global templates. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to visualize what this set of 1,000 global templates looks like. So I'll look at the actual parts that were detected in this set, and I'll fit a covariance matrix to those set of part locations. So this really represents, in a, it's still in a statistical approximation, but it's an approximation of the set of global templates that are generated by the model. What happens if you actually sample from that covariance matrix the way you actually do it, like every part yeah. and another one? They would, be, they would almost never look like a face, right? It would be a, it would be, it would be a very strange mix. If you just sample from the shape. Right? Yeah. Right? yeah. So uh, I, I'm wondering, is that, is that just a loss of the way you're, 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 you're that's what dynamic programming buys you? Or so, is it something just, um, I mean, so, it seems like there's a lot of structure that could be exploited, but then this is. So, so I guess the way I would say it is that it's almost the difference between a prior and a posterior. So the prior, if you, gen if you sample from the prior, you will see exactly where the tree breaks you down. You'll see sort of weird things out. If you sample from the posterior, you tend not to see that. And it's because you've learned good appearance. You think about if you learned really good local templates, then uh, you know, they'll always fire on the mouth and fire on the nose. So it's sort of the, the data term saves you. And it's kind of this combination of both. I, I think agree. The, the only point I, I make is that I think the power of representation is that it shouldn't allow you to represent that thing. Sure. And, and that may be one of the things that I'm saying. That the, sure. I think what you had shown, they really show good positive structure, but they still allow a lot of monsters. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree. So, so, so oftentimes, I feel like one of the, the one of the lessons for me, I guess, was that it seems like, you know, yes, we want to, uh, good representations are things that, that only allow, you know, valid things to be output. But if we think about that, that was all, that was, you know, in that slide where I showed the spectrum of shape, you can go all the way to the right hand side, which is, you know, these true mesh based representations, which feel very intuitive and you can kind of design to make sure they never give you something wacky. But then it turns out that those, those are hard to compute with. So I feel like a combination is what does it capture in terms of constraints and how computable is it? And so I feel like maybe this, this, this tree is this, it, what it feels like is, is this sweet spot where, yeah, you're giving up on something, but what you get is this efficiency where, uh, uh, but exploring it is, 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 is totally valid. Yeah, so I noticed that you're using hog throughout this entire <laughs> yeah. work, uh, which was really designed for these upright pedestrian uh, detectors. Is there anything that you wish that these the low-level features could do that it's sort of not doing? Is there anything you've noticed that sort of uh, is it seems like it's harder for hog than it ought to be? Um, yeah. So, so I, I will say that, like, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of sick of seeing hog too. If, if that was the, <laughs> the 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 underlying theme behind your question. So, we've been doing some work on trying to revisit low-level features. So, we have something where. Um, uh, um, where instead of using gradient descriptors, you try to enlarge and sort of look at a code book of different local features, and maybe that's, that's richer. Um, I, I don't know of a, of a particular answer that I can give you about what do I think is, what, what have I seen that's missing. Um, one thing that I find very awkward about HOG is the way that it was defined, because you can, although, you know, if you kind of read its definition from one perspective, it looks really confusing, because for every, uh, eight by eight region of pixels, you sort of encode it multiple times with different normalizations. But if you kind of just flip the perspective a bit, you can think about it as basically just defining a SIF descriptor on two by two regions um, of overlapping two by two regions. But what happens is, is that the same region gets encoded multiple times because it's overlapping. So I think that uh, um, we're working on, on, on a version that you can almost, it seems like if you wanted to really define a dense feature, you can do better than something that's that's kind of overlapping because there's some redundancy in that and and in and, and in work and for for example our, our original sort of our, well our, our PAMI uh, uh, part model paper we show that there's some kind of way to remove some redundancy with some PCA tricks but that also suggests to me that there's something kind of clunky about the way that it's glued together so so I feel like there's there's things to be done um, but I haven't sort of I guess um, um, I mean, other than the fact that, you know, we always want better low-level features, uh, I, I can't sort of point to something that I think is breaking about it. Uh. Uh, if you make the deformation model really expressive, can you now say that an image is made of objects with a parts of the image and further say that objects are made of object parts? 
So, if you make the deformation model like yearly expresses are running over all over the place, would that make the formal part one completely unsupervised and you don't even need a bounding box around all this? Um, so I don't quite follow the, the, the actual last part of the question. Um, so one thing is, I, I, one thing you could imagine is that it would be nice to have parts that have subparts, and uh, but that's not what you're asking. No, I want to say that instead of drawing a box around the object and the bounding box, uh -huh. make parts for it. Can you make it so much latent that I just draw a box around the image and say there are some objects in this image and these objects have parts? So, so I, I think I think some some folks have have looked at variations like that, and so it seems like uh, my, my understanding is that if you have a nice image set, then you can get away with that, where you don't need any initial box labeling. But if let's say you obtain a set of images uh, by googling a particular keyword, then maybe they're somewhat constrained enough where if you just start with a latent box that's around the whole image, you can kind of key in on it. Uh, my own feeling on that is that it seems like uh, so. It seems like, for my thing, the reason where where we should use unsupervised learning is where we can't provide the supervision, not where it's we're sort of being too lazy to provide the supervision. Like if we if we know how to actually label, you know, segment out the object, and it seems like we should, then why not provide that data? Um, you know, I feel like if we don't know what the right parts are, then that that seems like a valid reason why we should try to find unsupervised parts. But I think that that um, given your last point. So you showed this graph at the beginning of how detection has changed the performance. And um, there was a jump when you guys had this 2008 paper. And what I believed was the jump one, you can say I'm not, uh, because it's your processor, is because of this latent step, which had this. So you have this whole human marking uh, the box. And till the Vira Jones even the dark tricks, um, people thought that you just take these boxes, you can train a SVM on it, and it will work like a magic. But of course, they are not aligned boxes because humans they are not supposed to align the boxes at all. And what you guys had a, had a latent step where they, the latent step was aligning the boxes as it, as it was going, and so basically it kind of provided this jump. I think and that's what my my belief is that not the part; it's a latent step which kind of gives the huge boost uh, in the whole system. But uh, so, so and so. So my, basically what I am saying is that, so humans are not really good at providing inputs to computer on what computer should learn. And that's that's a whole philosophy of doing unsupervised, even then you can supervise. Because I don't know what computer should be wanting for, to learn. So why, why why should I define as a human that learn this, learn this by, or learn that or something like that. And that's one philosophy, I mean, philosophy of why we should not go supervised and we should go completely unsupervised in a system. Until you have to just provide this annotation or something. Um, okay, so let me answer two questions. So one is uh, the word I would key on is is, is what you said is, uh, is is alignment. So what the, what the latent step provided was better alignment. But if I really give you a bunch of images where sometimes people are shorter and sometimes people are taller, well, a better way to align is to also do an affine deformation. And I think that's really what what the parts allow us to do. Is that it's 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 an even more fine-tuned notion of alignment, but that seems like, for example, affine affine warp seem seem very natural to me. That if you have a template, more often than not, you can probably stretch it a little bit, maybe even rotate it a little bit, and you would still want to detect an object. So we know that there's there's some some amount of, of geometric variation that that's probably very natural. And so one way of doing it is you just take your template and you actually instantiate rotated and shifted copies of it. But why not just save yourself computational hassle and reuse the local scores, and you have a part model. So that, that's how I, I, I kind of map, map, uh, map that comment. Um, the second point you made about uh, uh, when, when, when a human should do it. So you're right. Like, I feel like we're not good at typing in the representation. Um, but there is some things that it seems like should be unambiguous. And so I feel like support masks, OK, sometimes they are ambiguous. But I feel like we can do a reasonable job of labeling what pixels belong to the object and what pixels don't. So I, I don't see why we should not so, provide so, okay, that. I mean, the um, unambiguous part is a physical thing. Yes. It's not a semantic. It's semantic exactly. It's generally not an ambiguous part. Yes. So it seems. Yes, and I, I really agree. But, then, but I still think that's very different than providing no, no supervision. Um, and so the, the other thing that, that I believe is that a little bit of supervision will go a long way. So even just sort of outlining you know, the, the sort of layout 
roughly speaking, where the object is seems a, a whole lot easier than, than providing nothing. And so I, I don't, personally, I feel like, you know, why not do that? Uh, okay. Sure. There are about many objects, and I have animated 4,000 images myself to this one class. Uh -huh. No. So uh, we, we played a little bit with applying these in video, but we haven't really pushed that. But this is, like in some sense, the, the modal analysis that I'm doing is, is, is very similar to the modal analysis that you do for an AAM model. Uh, right? You just take the, the landmarks and you have on some training data and you fit a, a Gaussian to it and you look at the eigenvectors of the Gaussian. Okay, I think we'll end the talk, but you can still talk, ask a question. <laughs> and, uh, okay. so that, uh, okay.